Okay, uh, welcome everybody, Mia Gowen. We're a few minutes behind, so let me flip back to the start of this. So what we're gonna talk about today is uh, how to measure speed in your performance, uh, how to measure the time, where the time goes in your program, which is the kind of key step in speeding things up. Okay, so what do you already know how to do? So you know how to uh, do big O analysis, and that's a powerful tool. So you know something at n squared is way slower than something that is uh, n log n, for example. So you can go recode uh, functions uh, with lower complexity in many cases, and that's gonna be a, a big hammer to speed up your program. Uh, you, can, you have knowledge based on 244 about what are, what are deep copies. So this is probably calling the copy constructor. Deep copies can be slow for big data structures. So after you get your big O down to a, a good value, the next most common thing that can be slowing a program down unexpectedly is you're, you're doing big copies. So you passed an entire vector by value, uh, or you did an assignment of one, in, one big vector or one big unordered map to another one. And those things can be slow. So you watch out for those. Um, people also do a lot of guessing. They just guess, I think this is slow because of that. And Programs are complicated enough and processors are complicated enough and compilers optimize in a complicated enough way that this guessing is very difficult. So people do it all the time, um, but it often leads you astray. You wind up like writing lots of code and optimizing lots of code that doesn't actually matter. So it is better to actually measure. And the most basic measurement is just use the stopwatch on your phone. But you can only do that for things that take quite a long time and it's kind of a pain and it's not all that accurate. Okay, so Lord Kelvin, creator of the Kelvin temperature scale, said if you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it. And this is a truism and lots of, lots of engineers kind of live by this truism. So when I was running projects in industry, that was the first thing that I would do, is how are we gonna measure the success or failure of this project? Like what are the metrics we're gonna measure to see if we're going in the right direction? And if you can do that, you can focus a team, you can see progress or lack of progress. Okay, so how are we gonna measure it? So I'm gonna show you three ways. So the first one is manual measurements. Manual measurements, not with your stopwatch, so a bit better than that. So you can write code to measure time. And I just already showed you some code in lecture, so we're gonna use that very similar code, but do it a little bit, a little more in depth. Uh, so if you write code to measure time, it has the lowest overhead. So that means the, the actual extra code you put in your program runs really fast. So it doesn't slow it down much, doesn't affect what you're measuring much. But whenever you're measuring a program, you have this issue of you can disrupt its behavior by adding measurements. Okay, it's kind of like the Heisenberg uncertainty principle for programs. Adding in manual measurements where you're getting the time for certain pieces of code is like the, code is like the least disruptive. Um, and it also is the only one of the techniques I'm gonna show you that can really, well, it, actually I guess number two can do this a bit too, but it can measure not just an entire function, you can even put timers around individual loops within a function. So you can measure very small pieces of code if you want to. Okay, so that's one technique we're gonna use. Second technique you can use is sample using the debugger. Now I'll show you how to do that. So in a debugger, you can just stop your program anytime you want with the pause button. You can look at where you are and then you can continue. If you do this a whole bunch of times, you, get a, you build up a picture of where what function and what loops am I usually in when I stop the program? And that gives you an idea of where am I spending my time. So it coarsely samples where runtime spent. And then the third technique we can use is basically an automatic version of this, which is profiling. So in profiling, what happens is your program is interrupted. Uh, so in 243, you guys have studied interrupts already? Okay. So your profiling, your program is interrupted about a thousand times a second. And every time it's interrupted, the profiler records what function are you in and how did you get there? What sequence of functions did you go to to get there? And it records that to disk. After the program is done, you can analyze that recorded information to see how much time did I spend in every function. It's not perfectly accurate because it's still just sampling what happened, um, but it's sampling a lot more than you could do by hand. So it's reasonably accurate. Okay, and this is a good way to identify you know, slow parts of your program when you're not quite sure. Because uh, this manual measurements, you might have to write quite a bit of code to go off and find that level of detail about where am I spending my time. 
Okay, so let's talk first about measuring performance manually. So um, the technique is basically get the timestamp before the code you care about, then get the timestamp after the code you care about, subtract before from the after, and print it out, okay? Uh, so let me show you, let's take the act on button press routine that we wrote last tutorial. Um, and if we want to time this, basically I want to get the time right at the start of the function, right there. And I want to get the time right at the end of the function right there and print out what's the difference between them. Okay, so getting the time at the very start. Basically we're using the chrono library. So I showed this in lecture, it's the same code here. So in the standard namespace, the standard library, uh, there's actually another namespace, sub namespace called chrono. So that's what those first couple of things are. And in that is a class called high resolution clock. And it has a member function called now. Okay, so it's a kind of a long line, but that's what it's doing. It's just getting all the way down to this now function, which is gonna return an object which represents the current time. We're gonna call that time start. Don't care what kind of object it is, so just use auto. Yeah. No, auto is just a convenience. So in C++, everything has a static type, which means that it gets a type and it doesn't change. Uh, auto does not change that, okay? Python has uh, dynamic typing. Things can actually change type because it's actually inside every object, Python stores what is your type, okay? <coughs> C++ doesn't do that. And that's why C++, part of why C++ is like 100 times faster. Um, so what auto does is it just basically says, I'm assigning some value to this variable right away. And that value is whatever this thing returns. The compiler knows what this thing's gonna return. So it can say, okay, fine, I can fill in the type. It's exactly the same as if you had typed it. it so it basically is done at compile time. At compile time, this says, you figure it out. And it can figure it out because it can say, well, you're immediately initializing it. So the type matches whatever that function returned. The code that will be generated, the machine code is identical to what you would get if you just filled the type in. But it's basically, I don't want, I have to go to c++.com to look up exactly what type it is. So I'm just kind of like, you know what? Just, just fill it in, right? I don't care. Um, so that's what that did. This, this now function, sometimes students are like, wait a second, how did you call this? You're saying that's a function inside this class. This is called the static method. The static method doesn't need an object. So we can just call it by just using its name. Um, so pretty long function name, but this is basically just a function call with a really long name. Uh, okay, so we get the start time. We do all our real code. And then we're gonna get the, the end time. So to get the end time, we just use the exact same function call again. And I'm gonna put it in a variable called end, okay? I subtract those two variables. That gives me the difference in time. That's again, this chrono object. And there's a bit of funky code here that says, uh, let's use this templated function called duration cast. And we wanna cast it to seconds. So this basically says, take that object and turn it into something, uh, another object that is a duration object in seconds. And then we're gonna print it out. And when we print it out, it just looks like this. We say delta time, which is this object I made up here, and dot count is just how much time. Uh, and I, I want my output to be understandable, so I don't just print out the time, I say act on button press took this long seconds. So I give a kind of user-friendly output. Um, so this code, you know, to use chrono code, you go, wait a sec, that's a bunch of funny looking functions. You just use them, right? Like that's how you use chrono. Uh, and you're just gonna use these same two functions over and over again, so don't worry about it. Um, so this is where like examples are helpful. Rather than reading all the documentation, you can just see, okay, there's an example of how to use it. Okay, so if I do this, every time somebody clicks the button, it's gonna say how long it took. Now, I might wanna put this in my program forever. Like just put it in the program, always have it run. Uh, and in that case, it's probably gonna be more convenient to print it to a file than printing it to the screen. Cause I don't wanna be clutter my screen up with all these messages all the time. So 
This code is showing you how to put it in a screen or in a file. So what I'm doing here is I'm basically opening a file. Okay, so it says I want an output file. In C++, output files are, they behave like streams. So they behave just like C out. Um, but this basically says I want an output file stream. That's what the OF stands for. And I'm gonna create an object of that type. Its name is profile CSV file. And I'm invoking its constructor. Its constructor takes as a name of a file. Okay, so this is a global variable because I wanna be able to write to this file all over the place. Global variables get constructed before your main, main routine like starts. So kind of before everything else in your program starts, global variables are constructed. So what this is gonna do is it's gonna basically open a file with this name and it's going to have a stream called profile CSV file that I can use to write into that file. Okay, that's just gonna happen when the program starts. Next, I've written a little helper function. Okay, so this helper function is called profile CSV. It takes in a start time and a string. And the string, I could pass any string in, but I'm saying I expect you to pass in a function name. Okay, so what is this doing? It basically gets the current time and it calls that end time. Then it does what I just did before. I subtract the end time minus the start time. And then I print out the time in seconds. So I print out to this file, profile CSV file, this string that you passed in, which is like a function name, the time. So you told me the start time and I'm telling you how much time has elapsed between that start time and right now, okay? And I print that out uh, and then I print out uh, basically a new line to make sure that output to files can be buffered, meaning it doesn't have to come out right away for efficiency reasons. If I put an, an end L or an end line, it has to come out right away. So it's gonna come out one line at a time, which is easier to read, and it's gonna come out right away, which is nice if I'm actually watching the file as my program runs. So that's what all of this does. Okay, with this helper function, I can now basically put timers in my code kind of more succinctly. So my act on button press, I can say, just get me the start time at the start, do all my real code, and then make a call to this profile CSV, which does all the rest of the work to, to basically figure out the elapsed time and write it out to a file. Okay, so now I can measure the time of any function I want or even any piece of a function I want with just two lines of code. So that's why I wrote this helper function. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? So this code can be useful to you. Just feel free to take it and put it in your program if you want. I've also put this in, which you, you don't have to do if you don't want to. Um, does anybody know what this does? You know what if defs do? Anybody seen if defs? Yeah, what does an if def do? Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like an old style pragma once, but it can be used for more than just pragma once. Pragma once says put this header file in once. This if def says if there's a variable called profiling that's defined, okay, and that has to be defined using what's called a preprocessor directive. So if I have this in my code, usually I'd put it in a header file. So if I have defined profiling, then everything in this if def will actually be compiled and put in your program. If I comment this line out, then this stuff will no longer go in the program. Okay, so it's a way, it's called conditional compilation. So this is, these if defs are a way that you can put code in your program and take it out again um, without actually de deleting it. So you don't have to use this. If you just wanna have profiling on all the time, don't worry about it. Just don't put in these if defs. If you want the ability to take it right out of your program, then you can use those if defs and you'll have to do a defined profiling somewhere at the top of the file or in a <coughs> header file that you include. Does that make sense? But if this confuses you, then just ignore these lines. You don't actually have to put them in. They just allow me to take this code, put this code in and take this code out. Okay, I'm writing this out in a comma separated value format. So I write out the name of the function, then a comma, then I write out the time. Um, I'm doing that because it's easy to read into a spreadsheet. Uh, and yeah, this, this is basically the same as standard colon endl. 
I'll probably change that after the lecture. Uh, and it just makes a new line and it forces the output to be actually sent out to the file right away rather than buffered, which again can be useful if you're watching the file as the program runs. Basically for efficiency, Safe++ allows files to be buffered, meaning it, can, it doesn't have to write to them right away. It can just keep the data in memory and then write it later. Uh, and in this case, that might be inconvenient. I kind of want to make sure after I'm done a line that it actually writes it out right away. Yeah. Yeah, C out also is buffered. So if you don't, if you write a bunch of characters to C out and you don't put an end else, it may not show up on the screen. It will eventually show up on the screen, but basically C++ is allowed to buffer up C out until it gets an end L. Uh, and it's because end L actually does something called a flush. So end L basically writes a new line and then calls a routine called flush to make sure that the output has appeared. Um, or you ask for input. When you ask for input, C++ standard says you have to flush. If you ask for data from C and you have to make sure the data from C out has appeared. Because um, otherwise you could get bizarre situations where you say enter, enter the name of the map, but it doesn't actually appear and you're waiting for something to come in. So to avoid that, they say, if you're waiting for something from C in, then C out must be flushed out. Does that make sense? Um, but yeah, if you don't have indels in your code, sometimes they can cause confusion. If you're like, where did my output go? It's not lost, but it's buffered. It's not coming out yet. Okay, so with this code, I'm gonna get, uh, I, mean, I can make a basic a little spreadsheet that has um, what time do I spend in different functions? And it's gonna look like this, name of function and time. Okay. All right, so let me show you that. I'm gonna basically, okay, so let me go and bring up a VNC session. Okay, so here's our reference solution. And it has, let's see. Okay, let me shrink this down a little bit. Okay, so here's our reference solution. And it has a screen redrawing function called draw. That's like our top level redrawing function. So it draws the whole, redraws the whole canvas where we're drawing the map. Um, and I've already put in this profiling code. Okay, so I say get a start time at the start of the routine. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of helper functions in here. Okay, so I draw the features, um, some debugging stuff that this is grayed out because I have not defined this variable. So this won't be compiled. Then I draw all the segments, which are the roads. Uh, let's see, I label, so put text labels on points of interest. I put labels for text labels on streets. Uh, this is for later in the course. Um, I draw, if you've turned on subways, we'll draw the subways. And at the very end of the program of the routine, you see, we call this profile CSV function that I just showed you. And I pass in the start time and I want it to print the string draw with a few dashes in front of it. Okay, so I'm timing this routine. I just got the start time at the beginning and I call this profile CSV at the end. So it's gonna time this routine. Your redraw routine should have lots of helper functions uh, and ours does, so if I go to this helper function, draw all features. Uh, I'm timing it too. Okay, so draw all features also gets a start time. And it also calls profile CSV, but it says draw all features. Uh, let's see, what other ones we got in here? Here's draw all segments. So this is the one that draws streets. And again, I'm getting a start time. I'm doing a bunch of drawing. And then I call this profile routine to say how long it took. Uh, and so on. So basically, I've I put timers around the whole redraw routine, redraw function, because that's pretty important to measure. And I put timers around every one of the helper functions, um, so that I can see where does the time break down. Okay, so I'm going to run this to get my little spreadsheet. Uh, what build do you think I should use? <laughs> 
Here's my menu of builds. So I'm timing this. What build's going to give me the most accurate results? Right, so I should do release. The other ones are really, yeah, about debugging. Whoops. Okay, and I'll just do a clean and build to make sure that I know what I've got. Got a bit bigger. Okay, this is going to take a minute to compile and then I'll run it. Okay, so you can watch the files that are in our reference solution. So, Okay, so it's almost done. All right, so it's done. So now I'm just going to run it. Um, it's going to take a few seconds for load map to run, and then the graphics come up. Okay, so. Okay, so I've instrumented all of these um, functions, my redraw functions. I want to trigger a bunch of redraws because that's what I care about measuring. So I'm going to, I'm going to, Turn on subway display, and I'm going to turn on labeling of names. We don't label any names when we're zoomed way out right now. Uh, so you don't see anything, but it's on now. And it's going to zoom in. So as I zoom in, everything's doing a redraw. Okay, zoom in, some level of detail modeling goes on. Okay, and then maybe I'll zoom right back out. Okay, so I got a bunch of redraws. I hit proceed to end the program. Okay, so that, if I go out here, this is the directory where I was running this in. Oops, LSSL. Okay, so right now is 1040 and this or 1041. This says I just generated this file funk.funkperf.csv. Okay, so I just generated the CSV file. Uh, CSV is common separated value. So it's a format that spreadsheets can easily use. So I go to Office, LibreOffice Calc, and I'm going to open it. And, and it comes in in a kind of a nice format, right? And I could even do math on this if I wanted or some, you know, do this a few times, put them all in spreadsheets, see if it's getting faster or slower, etc. Okay, so what can I see in here? So I put these profiling timers around a bunch of my routines. Load map takes about 8.7 seconds. Um, my first draw function took 0.38 seconds, which is pretty slow. And you can see most of the time was in drawing the features. Okay, drawing the roads wasn't as slow. Your first redraw in uh, EasyGL or most graphics libraries can be a bit slower because the graphics library can be caching fonts and various things that it might need again in the future. So I'm not gonna pay too much attention to my first redraw. I kind of more care about my second redraw. Okay, my second redraw actually is a bunch faster. So let's look at this one. Yeah, so my second redraw took 0 0.06 seconds. And again, the features was the number one thing, took 0 0.05 seconds and street segments was next took about 0 0.016. Labeling POIs, uh, labeling, putting names on streets, drawing the subways. Um, well, drawing the subways didn't happen yet, but uh, nothing else took any significant time. Okay, the next redraw is about the same speed. And you can see subway stations were really fast, 0 0.005. Main time went into features again, but it's pretty good, 0 0.03. And drawing the streets took 0 0.01. And together those added up to about the whole redraw time. So my redraw is looking pretty fast. It looks pretty good. Uh, I did a bunch of zoom ins. And they all look kind of similar. They're getting a little faster. So instead of 0 0.04, my redraw is taking 0 0.03. Why do you think it got faster? So any ideas? This is a pretty common thing you may find in your program too. 
So as I zoomed in, it got a bit faster. Any ideas? Yeah, so EasyGL preclips. So if things are off screen, even though I'm drawing the same stuff, it gets faster. So things are getting a bit faster as I zoom in, which is good. Everything's looking pretty good here. Okay, as I kept zooming in, it's getting a little faster still. Okay, so look at that one, still a bit faster. All good. Uh, and let's just keep going down here. Okay, this draw now suddenly is a lot slower. Okay, so at 0 0.03 seconds, that one is 0.35. So it's like 10 times slower. So this is where watching the file as it's generated or, or keeping track of how many times you've zoomed in is useful. What happened here is that's where, if you're watching carefully when I was doing this, you saw at a certain zoom level, we started drawing buildings and more streets. So we have some level of detail modeling. When you're zoomed out, we're not drawing everything. We got below, zoomed in enough, we started drawing pretty much everything. Uh, and it slowed things down. So now my redraw is a bit slow. Where does the time go? Mostly in drawing features. Okay, so features like parks and rivers and so on. Drawing the roads also took a noticeable amount of time. I didn't really spend any time labeling things and the subways were really fast. Okay, if I keep going down here, um, I, the trend stays basically the same. Okay, so the number one thing to worry about for me is features. Number two is drawing streets. Nothing else in my code here is taking significant time. Uh, and clearly it's a lot slower when I basically draw everything, when I hit that level of detail point. Okay, so does that make sense to everybody? So I didn't add very much code to my program and this can help me tune a lot. It also can give me data that's impressive for my uh, OP1, right? I, instead of saying, I think the program's pretty fast, or I think we did this and that optimization and it might've been helpful, you can actually give measurements. And that, that's a better way to drive a project. So your CI is gonna like that a lot better. Okay, so that was the first technique to, uh, to measure speed. Let me show you quickly uh, the next thing. Okay, so timers are good, but you have to know where to put them or you have to write code to put them in. It can be inconvenient. And if you have a lot of code and you don't know where the time's going, it might take you quite a while to write all the timers. So another technique you can use is um, the manual profiling that I talked about earlier. So you run the debugger, you stop it by hitting this pause button, you look at where you are, um, so you can hit the call stack to see what routine am I in and how did I get here? And then you can say, keep going by hitting this green button again. Okay, do that a few times and you see, well, where am I? And it tells you what, you know, where's your time going? Okay, you repeat this. If you just did it once, you know, you might not have much faith in the result, but if you do it 10 times and you keep showing up in the same function, you go, that's probably my problem. Okay. So for milestone two, a couple challenges. Your redraw function is probably too fast to use this technique. So my redraw function was 0 0.03 sometimes uh, seconds and 0.35 sometimes. Both of those are too fast for me to click on. Uh, so I'm gonna slow it down. So I'm gonna put a loop around my redraw function and just gonna redraw 30 times. Obviously do not wanna leave this code on when I do my final submission, because that would be really stupid. Uh, <laughs> but it's gonna allow me to like do this pause and continue and kind of get information easily. Um, second question, what build to use? So you can use any build with this technique. The release build is again, the one that has the highest performance, it's the most accurate. So it's a reasonable choice to do this pause and continue on. The release build is optimized. So it is harder to interpret the results. And in particular, one of the optimizations that's done is called function inlining. Does anybody know what function inlining means? Okay, so in 2.43, uh, when you call a function, you've learned about how functions are called, right? What instruction do you use? Yeah, you use a branch to subroutine, and before you do that, you push some information on the stack, call branch to subroutine, subroutine runs, pushes some results on the stack, come back, you grab them. All of that has overhead, okay? That all took time. If your function did a whole bunch of work, that overhead is negligible. But if your function does only a little bit of work and you're calling it millions or hundreds of millions or billions of times, it can add up. So, so a good example would be pushback. 
pushback is a function that you literally may call a billion times. Um, so that adds up now, all that overhead. The compiler, though, can get rid of that overhead for small functions by doing what's called inlining. And it basically means it just takes the whole function and it pastes it in the calling function. So it doesn't really call it. It basically just sticks the code in. So from the point of view of the programmer, it's still nice. You see a function, you get to reuse it, but the compiler really stuck the code in to get rid of the overhead. Okay, release build will do that. So the compiler has a whole bunch of heuristics to guess when is that a good idea and it does it. Pushback is a classic example. It's gonna inline pushback for sure. Um, so what that can do though, when you're doing this pause and continue is some of your functions don't exist anymore. So instead of seeing that I'm in this little function, you just see that you're in the bigger function that calls it because the little function doesn't exist. Does that make sense? So we have a profile build. Profile build is optimized. So it's just like release build, except it turns off one optimization, it turns off inlining. So it is slower. So on the one hand, it has the disadvantage of it. The results are not as, I don't have as much fidelity, right? Because they're not the release build, but it's still pretty optimized. And it has the advantage of, you can actually see when you're in even little functions. Okay, so both release and profile are reasonable choices when you do this technique. Okay, so let me quickly demo that. All right, so, okay, so I'm gonna switch, I'm gonna demo this on profile. So I'm gonna switch to profile build and I'm gonna rebuild this. Okay, so we can take a minute to rebuild the master solution here, the golden solution. Uh, and then I'm, I'm not gonna just run it with the green arrow, I'm actually gonna run it through the debugger because I wanna be able to do this pause. Okay, so that's the button I'm getting ready to push as soon as this thing is done compiling. And there's one more thing I need to do. I said this is gonna be too fast for me to pause. So I've already written a loop around my whole redraw function. So you see this is for i equals zero, i less than num redraws. So this is a loop that all it does is do multiple redraws. So I'm gonna change it to 30. Okay, so I'm slowing my redraw function down by a factor of 30, but it still is gonna give me the right, where do I spend my time? Because it's just gonna do the same thing 30 times. Okay, so I'm gonna make that change. I'm gonna recompile this. It's be fast now because I only changed one file. Okay, so now I'm gonna start the debugger. Okay, so the debugger's running. I haven't set any breakpoints. So you can run the debugger without breakpoints. Uh, load map is starting. Okay, so move us over here. All right, so I'm gonna turn on subway display and name display, so I get kind of the most um, testing of my code. And my redraws are slow now, right? I intentionally just slowed them down by a factor of 30. Okay, so I'm gonna zoom in a few times. Okay. And I'm gonna zoom in until I hit that point where, you know, my level of detail modeling says draw everything because that's kind of where I'm more concerned about speed. Speed when I was zoomed out was pretty good. Okay, and those redraws are gonna be kind of slow, right? They were taking a third of a second. I just slowed them down by a factor of 30. They're gonna take like 10 seconds each. It's gonna be slightly painful. But pretty soon it should finish redrawing. All right, so just finished the redraw. So I'm gonna click zoom in again, and now I'm gonna start pausing. So I pause, okay, and I'm down in some weird standard library thing. I wanna hit the call stack to see how to get here. Okay, so, and I look for, I look back in the call stack. So this is where I am, but I wanna look back how to get there. So I got here from Phil Pauly, which was called by draw feature 
which is called by draw all features. And I can even see, you know, which feature number am I drawing right now? Whoops, okay, so this has been optimized out, so I, I can't see it easily. Um, so that's still the challenge of working with a mostly optimized build, but I can tell that I'm drawing features. Uh, and I can keep going. So I'm gonna say, okay, keep going again, pause again. Okay, well, this time when I paused again, uh, I'm again in draw feature. Okay, so I'm drawing all the features. I'm drawing a particular one. And it's actually putting together the list of feature points and so on. Okay, so let's just pause, let's do this again. Okay, and I'm still in draw feature. Okay, so draw feature again. Run it again, pause. Uh, okay, and I'm in draw feature again. Okay, so this is lining up with what my timers told me. I'm spending most of my time in draw feature. Every time I stop this, I seem to be in draw feature. Okay, and let's see if I get anywhere else or if it's always draw feature. Yeah, so it's always been draw feature so far. So clearly that's the routine that's kind of dominating uh, what I'm doing, okay? Okay, and most of those I was drawing polygons. This one, I'm now drawing a line, okay? So that's kind of interesting. So this is, I'm drawing not just closed, poly, closed features with polygons, I'm also drawing features with lines, uh, open, poly, open features, okay? This one also, again, is in draw line. It's an open feature. Okay, so what have I learned so far? I seem to be spending most of my time in draw features, and some of them are polygons and some are lines. I mean, I would have actually thought I'd spend most of my time drawing polygons because it seems harder, but I've actually been drawing a lot of lines. The open features seem important too. Uh, I could keep doing this for a while, see if I learn anything more. But I'm gonna stop now. Uh, and I did learn a reasonable amount from that. Okay, so let me go back here and let's talk about the, the last thing. Okay, so that was manually profiling. Now I wanna do, use an automatic profiler to sort of gather more statistics more quickly. So you, we can, you can actually profile any configuration, but the usual one you'll profile is the profile configuration because it, it's optimized, but turns off inlining. But you could also profile the release build if you want. You just won't get as much information on the little functions. The easiest way to do profiling after that is you can run the exerciser with the profile option. So I'm actually gonna run just the Toronto map, which EC297 exercise has in it. So I'm gonna say run the Toronto map exerciser and I want to do it with profiling on. That's going to produce a really big data file, uh, which I can't really interpret. So I'm going to run this EC297 profile visualize tool to let me see what it's done. And I'm going to keep my loop around my redraw function. because I, I want to actually have most of my time spent in redraw because I don't want to spend a bunch of, I don't want all the top routines that tells me about to be in load map. I don't care about load map right now. Okay, so I'm going to leave my 30x uh, slowdown. I don't have to do that. If I actually just ran the program and clicked around for long enough, eventually my redraw function would be the most important thing, but I don't feel like doing that. So I'll just leave it in, okay? Let me go show you what this looks like. Okay, so we've already got the profile build. Let's make sure that it's up to date. It is. Uh, so I'm gonna go to the terminal and I'm gonna run EC297 exercise, milestone two. Um, remember you can get the names of the testers by just saying list testers. Okay, so that told me the names. I'm gonna say, I want the Toronto one. So I'm gonna say run tester, draw Toronto. Uh, and I wanna use this profile option, okay? So it generates, it's basically gonna interrupt my program a thousand times a second and generate a bunch of data about where is it. So anyway, it's running, starting up my load map. Okay, let's just move this over here. Okay, so I'm gonna turn on subways again. I'm gonna turn on drawing of names again, and I'm gonna start zooming in. And because my redraw has been slowed down by a factor of 30, it's still gonna be kind of slow. It's going to take me a little while to generate enough data. Okay. 
right? So I'm gradually zooming in just to generate a bunch of redraws. And I kind of also want to get to that higher level of detail and see what that does. Okay, and soon this should finish redrawing. All right, and now I'm gonna say exit the program. Okay, so that's done. If I do an LS, there's this file called perf data that's been generated and it's big. Okay, so perf data is 59 megabytes. So I don't wanna look at that by hand. Let's say EC297 profile visualize uh, perf data. Okay, so we've got a visualization tool for you that's gonna let you see what's in, well, interpret that data and draw it for you, okay? Because you don't wanna look at 60 megabytes of data. And this file's big enough, it's gonna take a few seconds to chew through it, and then it's gonna open up a display and we can look at it. All right, so now we can see this. Um, okay, so green routines are ones where we spend more time. So basically the color coding uh, you know, these orange routines we spend a lot of time in, the blue routines, not much. So I got to zoom in a bit before I can see anything. Let me keep going over here. Okay, so I'm just hitting control plus to zoom in. Uh, okay, so this says, there's a bunch of routines in here that I don't recognize. They're like standard library startup routines. That's fine. So this says, draw Toronto to test start. This says that 60% of my time came from routines that were called by this and 0% came from routines that like from actually what's in it. Okay, so the body of this function is really fast, 0% time, but what it called added up to 60% of my runtime. There are a bunch of standard library startup things, the unit test startup things. I don't care what any of these are. None of them are taking any real time. And then it basically says, okay, now we're into uh, some stuff I do recognize. So it says 12% of my time came from a call to load map uh, and load map called some helper functions. Okay, so load map itself took 0%, but it plus its helper functions took 12% of my time. So there's a helper function called investigate OSM. It took 5.2% of my time. There's a routine called hash things that it called that took 2% and so on. Okay, so this is telling me where my load map time went. But I don't actually care about load map. So let's go over and look for where my redraw function is. Okay, so let's see. If I go over here, let me zoom in a bit. Okay, this draw map. Okay, it says draw map took 48% of my time. I gotta go trace down where did that go? Okay, it took a bit of time loading PNGs. And let's see, there's a whole bunch of like C, uh, standard library setup stuff, but I don't care about any of that. Here I'm getting into what really matters. Okay, so this is actually my, this is my redraw function. Okay, so I recognize this. That is my main redraw function and it took 83% of my time. It's all in helper functions. Drawing the roads took 14% and zoom out a little. And drawing the uh, features took 68%. Uh, in drawing those features, let's see. It took a little while to figure out whether it's a closed feature, 5% of our time. Uh, we took 12% figuring out what kind of feature it is. And, and then let's see, basically we spent 13% of our time calling fill poly. And we spent 33% of our time calling draw line. Okay, so what do we figured out again? Features matter, and actually we're spending more time drawing the open features than the closed ones. Maybe we could also optimize a few other things like, uh, you know, is it a closed poly or is it a closed feature or not? So this allows us to rapidly figure out where do we spend our time. Uh, and as I said, you're gonna get a bunch of routines you don't recognize that the standard library put in. You can kind of just skip over those. You just follow the arrows till you get the things you recognize. 
Okay, and then the last thing, I will very, it's in the slides, so uh, you can see this in another way. It's called a flame graph. So if I use this dash T flame graph, it's just gonna visualize the data in a different way. And what this is showing me is basically draw takes a bunch of my time. Maybe I wanna zoom in on the redraw function, so let's do that. Basically it shows me my redraw function is all the way across and it took 50% of my time. And 38% of the time went into draw features, 12% to drawing segments. If I keep going, I can see, okay, how much of that time was in get feature type versus draw segments and so on. I can keep kind of zooming in. If I wanna look at draw feature, I can see again that a bunch of the, most of the time for draw feature is in draw line with a reasonable amount in fill poly. So this is an alternative way to visualize the, uh, the runtime. It's kind of a stacked chart showing how much time went in this routine, how much time went into each of the things it calls. Okay, uh, thanks everybody. So hopefully this is helpful to you in optimizing milestone two uh, and in the later milestones.